Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IS and a very warm welcome to our weekly roundup of international events. What we try to do in this program is to convey to you the latest developments as they take place all over the world. We cast a look at changing power equations and as always our emphasis is Indocentric. We try to examine and explore how events are going to impact on our foreign policy, our national interest. And a very interesting uh, selection of these events we have for you this week. Uh, to begin with it is the crisis in Ukraine. It is very seldom in international relations that a crisis hangs on for such a long period. And especially if it's a confrontation between the two powers, two superpowers, they may not be all equal at the moment, but two major powers, more important than any other actor in international affairs. And if they are in an eyeball to eyeball confrontation, the chances are that either diplomacy reduces the tension or the flashpoint is reached and it diffuses itself, tension is reduced. Very often is there is a risk of a nuclear holocaust and analysts this time have been speculating that this is as bad as it was in the worst days of the Cold War in the middle of the 20th century. So this is what we like to begin with. And then there are other interesting developments elsewhere in East Asia, uh, in Africa, in South Asian continent. We shall take them up one by one. First of all, Ukraine. Uh, for months now, Russia has kept the world on tenterhooks. He has amassed a mass uh, number of troops on Bel in Belarus on Ukrainian border, threatening an Im immediate invasion of Ukraine. Now, some people have thought that this is a show of strength. It is a bluff. Putin only wanted to see whether Biden will blink first, whether the NATO and European Union will be divided for, for their difference of national interests, and he would be able to salami slice Ukraine. Now, we have discussed Ukraine before with you, but it would be useful to quickly revise what is at stake. Uh, Ukraine is essential for Russian security. It is the barrier which divides the Eurasian Russia with Europe proper, the West Europe, and a small buffer of East European states. Uh, Ukraine, like many other countries in East Europe, Europe, was part of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic. And these republics were satellites. They were supposed to be almost semi-colonies of the, the Russia proper. And these people, uh, Brezhnev had propounded a doctrine of limited sovereignty about these. So these were supposed to be subordinate, subservient states, if not client states, to, to Soviet Union. But after the decline and disintegration of Soviet Union, many of these republics declared independence. So did Ukraine. And there was a period between the decline of uh, Soviet Union, emergence of a very weak Russia, and these states trying to look westwards for economic prosperity, for economic security, for uh, national security as well. And Ukraine's case is especially important. While Russia was quite prepared, well, it was not quite prepared, but reconciled to uh, Poland and Hungary, Czechoslovakia and Romania going away uh, towards the west. Um, but Ukraine was considered critical. This is what Putin has been repeatedly saying, that don't cross this red line because this is where we think our vital interests are involved. Uh, and of course, this is understandable because the, uh, the concept of Russia, the Russian Empire, started with the capital of Ukraine, Kyiv, um, which was Rus. And it is integral to the Russian personality, their religious beliefs, their cultural traditions are closer to Ukraine than they were to other East European countries like, let's say, uh, Hungary, Poland, etc. What is even more interesting is that uh, in 2014, Putin made a grab for Crimea. And in Crimea, he placed the Black Sea Fleet of the Russians. And this annexation, this unilateral intervention in Crimea was uh, surprising for the West because the West could not react to it. They had already imposed on Russia, on Putin for his reckless diplomatic behavior, uh, uh, stringent economic sanctions. They imposed some more economic sanctions, but those economic sanctions did not deter uh, Putin. And the Russian president had followed a very interesting strategy. He had always said that the West is trying to destabilize Ukraine, basically to create problems for Russia. And there is a conspiracy of the West to tempt and attract Ukraine uh, to ask for a membership of NATO, ask for a membership of the European Union. And uh, this was not acceptable to Russia. So what had happened was that there were colored revolutions in former uh, Soviet republics, Georgia, Ukraine. and. Uh, 
Putin had always insisted that to safeguard Russian vital interest, he had to control critical areas of strategic sensitivity. Crimea, the Crimean Peninsula was one. So when this happened and the West kept watching, the Russians were confident that they could probably continue with this kind of a thing. Now, the demographic profile of Ukraine is also very interesting. There is Eastern uh, Ukraine, which is Donbas, which is Lunets, which is Lusank, uh, Donets, these areas, these are supposed to be autonomous republics. Now, autonomous republics is a very odd acronym uh, because these autonomous republics claim to be autonomous, claim to be almost independent, but still they are part of the Ukraine. And most of the people who stay here are people who speak Russian, they are ethnically of Slav race, and of course they are different from the the Western Ukrainians. The, this territory also is where the coal mines are, where the industrial complexes were built by the uh, during the days of the Soviet Union. It had an international airport, but unfortunately, years of warfare has destroyed the airport. The industrial uh, economy has gone downhill all the time. So these people are ill off now. The, why separatism and secessionism is rife here is not only because of ethnic loyalties, ethnic affinities, not because of Russian language, because most of the population also speaks Ukrainian. The other interesting part is this, that the majority of the population may be middle-aged, but almost 40% of the population is of pensioners, which means that a large segment of the population of eastern Ukraine is very aged, they are not productive, and most of the Russians are reluctant to accept these brethren within their fold. But the utility of this area for Russia is great because if these so-called autonomous republics remain as a part of Ukraine, they can uh, carry their electoral weight in the parliament and resist Ukraine's uh, uh, move to join either NATO or to join the European Union. Uh, now what the West has been saying is that Russians have been deliberately using agents provocateurs in this territory to create uh, disaffection about the U Ukrainian central government. And of course, uh, they say that they have a duty to support their own brethren. Uh, thousands of Russian passports have been issued to the in this eastern Ukrainian territory. And the Russians say that, well, they are not going to attack Ukraine at all. But if Ukraine attacks this territory, they will be honor bound to defend their brethren. Now, the, the Western argument is that Putin is only trying this to provoke incidents and then have a preemptive defense or defensive attack on this territory and use this. Now, this has continued for months. Uh, till very recent weeks, there has been no shelling. Although since Crimea, annexation of Crimea by Russia and present day, uh, thousands of people have lost their lives in intermittent shelling, fighting, etc. Even before that, there had been exchanges between the military. Now, the Russians have been claiming that they are only indulging in military exercises, whether it is Belarus or whether it is in the eastern border uh, of Ukraine. But the fact remains that in recent weeks, the flashpoints have been very high. There has been shelling, a kindergarten school was targeted. Uh, there has been a loss of life of civilians. Soldiers have been dying. Uh, President Biden has been reluctant to commit American troops here to help Ukrainians because he thinks if the American troops are rendered casualties, then there would be no drawing back and America would be forced to have a direct warfare with Russia. They, they want to avert a nuclear uh, conflagration between the two superpowers. But most analysts agree that this is it is not necessary for Putin to indulge into this kind of warfare. He can continue with salami slicing. Slowly he can either, but does the Russian president want territory or does he want weakening of the central government, which is anti-Putin at the moment, to an extent where only a shell of Ukrainian sovereignty and independence remain and Russia actually controls it. There have been uh, charges that is the West that has been provoking Putin for this. Um, they say they have shifted the troops, NATO troops from Germany to Polish border, which is right next door to, to Russia. And the Russians say that if you keep telling Ukrainians that they can join the NATO, and then there is an Article 5 in the NATO Charter, which says that any member of the NATO attack uh, would be treated as an attack on the other members and there would, they would come to its defense. So uh, Russians make it very clear that this is what the red line is. 
Now, at the same time, there has been, since the retreat from Afghanistan, of America, the US president's credibility is very, very low. Not only low among, uh, low in the eyes of the Russian president, but among the eyes of his own uh, allies in NATO and especially in the European Union, the French and the Germans. So they think that they do not necessarily have to fall prey to American pursuit of their limited national interest here. Uh, till last week, what most people thought was, uh, Putin declared that he was withdrawing after the military exercises, the Russian troops from the Ukrainian border. He said nothing about the Belarusian border. So people thought that he had blinked. They thought that uh, Biden had got in this war of attrition, war of nerves, got the better of Putin. But we think that this was hasty conclusion. Uh, they were saying that he had made a very good opening in a, in a chessboard, but his end game was floundering, that is Putin's. But Putin uh, is a very clever person. Uh, once he had decided to expose the American weakness and reluctant reluctance and tiredness to confront Russia in a direct conflict. And the example of this was when President Biden said, the, he said that we are closing down our embassy there, we are asking uh, non-essential staff to move out of that place and issued a warning uh, to all the American citizens that they should move out of Ukraine within 48 hours because Americans would not be in a position, their government would not be in a position to send rescue teams to get them out of the country, which was almost a mixed signal conveyed to Europe and to Russia that he was not willing to fight immediately. At the same time, there was a speculation that the Russian president was only waiting for the Winter Olympics to be over uh, in China as not to embarrass its allies because there were some participants in that Winter Olympics from European countries, from Canada, from US. Only a diplomatic boycott of the Winter Olympics had been effected. But now, as the Winter Olympics draw to a close, uh, the Russian president has shown his hand again. He holds all the trumps. He doesn't have to indulge in an attack. If he does, if he does even a symbolic attack, four or five fronts would be open. The Russian troops or the Belarusian troops would attack Ukraine from the north and make a push towards the capital Kiev. Uh, there would be from eastern end in the in Donbas, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk region. It would be there uh, from south Crimea. There could be a thrust upwards, but he would not have to control territory. Once this happened, uh, the Ukrainians have been armed, the civilians have been asked to move out, they have been vacated, and militias have been mobilized. So there might be, and these, these mobilia, militias are not small. There are hundreds of thousands of people, able-bodied young people who are willing to fight to protect their country. Now this happens, the potents are not good. This would be a long drawn civil war. So what does Russia get out of this? Now, nobody thinks that the civil war will come. But what is there that the Putin has shown the world that Americans are not in a position to take him on. Americans have threatened him with dire consequences, with even more stringent um, economic sanctions, get, uh, boycotting the Russia from the international exchange mechanism of banking, the SWIFT system, etc. But can it be done? And some people have argued that the more the West does this, the more strong the will of Putin becomes to put in place an alternative economic uh, cooperation system for the East Europeans, his allies and also towards Central Asian republics and throws him closer and closer into the Chinese embrace. One factor in this was the Nord 2 uh, gas pipeline, submarine pi pipeline, which the Germans had made it very clear that they would not let it be operational if the Russians invaded uh, Ukraine. Uh, now interestingly, what would qualify as the Russian invasion of Ukraine. If the Russian forces do not cross into Ukrainian territory and if the East Ukrainians, the separatists, take up arms and the Russian accepts them within its fold or supports them or the Americans do not send troops but send uh, arms and arsenal and logistical supplies to West Ukrainians, how would this pan out? How would this work out? Over a period of time, this war of attrition can only end uh, damaging Ukrainian sovereignty and independence and also sharpening the fractures within the European Union and the NATO allies. So the NATO generals might make one statement. Uh, Brussels European Union headquarters come out with other statements. France and Germany indulge in bilateral negotiations with uh, Russia on their own. Uh, 
at times the British Prime Minister tries it, the, sends the Foreign Minister, sends the Defence Minister. All these diplomatic activities have been in vain. So diplomacy continues. The Russian Parliament has passed a resolution that the autonomous republics should be reinserted in Russia. But Putin has not given heed to that. So this is mixed signalling going on all along. Maybe in a day or two, as we speak, uh, the crisis may be either resolved, tension diffused through more hectic diplomacy, not certainly at United Nations, because there it is only a stalemate, only a statement of uh, good intentions is made, or it might be not an all-out military war, but outbreak of hostilities, and one will have to wait and watch how it unfolds. When world's attention was focused on the events in Ukraine, some very disturbing and distressing developments were taking place in the North American continent itself. This was in Canada. What had happened was that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau had been strictly enforcing the COVID uh, vaccination program and truck drivers were told that if they did not have uh, vaccination certificates, they would not be allowed to ply their trade, they would not be allowed to cross the border with the United States of America. Now, the situation is a little ironical because according to government statistics, 85% of the truck drivers in Canada have been properly vaccinated against the COVID pandemic. But the remaining 15% are very vocal. They insist that not taking vaccines is their fundamental right. They also have a right to protest peacefully. They also have a right to freedom of expression. Now, they descended in their thousands. They laid a siege of the capital Ottawa and they held to ransom the by occupying public places uh, and disturbing the public life, civic life in other big cities like Toronto. Now this was called the Freedom Convoy. Now the Freedom Convoy had certain characteristic traits. They loudly honked their horns, they disturbed the peace of the cities, they made camps, temporary camps with uh, water closets, with uh, chemical toilets, with recreation facilities, with canteens. It was almost not a protest movement, as the people said. It was an occupation by hostile forces of their cities. Now, they might have had some sympathy to begin with uh, among the sections of people who are in opposition parties, opposing uh, Trudeau and his uh, pseudo-liberalism. But the way the truckers behaved, it almost was a replay of the Trump supporters attacking the Capitol Hill after he had lost the elections. There were other issues which were disturbing. So for the truckers, it was some kind of a carnival. The music was loudly played. They were eating. They were Their sympathizers were giving them food, beverage, etc. But there were, there were also accusations that they were being funded from across the border. So Give, Send, Go was a billion dollar fund which was collecting money in America and sending it for these. Although some people say that there were also uh, 100,000 supporters, Canadian supporters who generously uh, gave, gave in support of the truckers. But let's not, let's come to this point a little later. Who was funding them? Was there a conspiracy against um, Trudeau which was being hatched across the borders? Trudeau did mention it, but we'll come to the economic impact of this, this event very badly. Uh, there was an impact almost of half a billion dollars of trade which takes place between Canada and America across the Ambassador's Bridge. Uh, now the Ambassador's Bridge was blocked, traffic did not move and the impact was so bad that across the border on the American side, the Ford Motor Company and the General Motor Company had to shut down, even Toyota, had to shut down their plants. The, first they cut down the productions, then it was impossible to carry on and this was amounting to, a, I mean not only the automobiles, Although the automobiles are a large part of uh, a, a, a U.S. Canadian trade, there also are dairy products, there are also food products, perishable food products, there is also animal husbandry, etc. Now, this led to a situation was, where it was impacting not only on Canada's economy, it was impacting on the U.S. economy as well and creating disturbances. Now, interestingly, in Canada, the policing charges in cities like Ottawa almost were coming to $800,000 a day. And people were very worried that if the, if the, if the three-week-long freedom convoy did not uh, uh, withdraw its protest movement, it would amount to $2.5 million a day just on policing and maintaining law and order. So this was getting terribly, um, uh, shall we say, intolerable. 
Now, while this was going on in Canada, um, Trudeau tried to, first of all, Trudeau was whisked away from his official residence to a secret destination, which created a bit of a panic. People thought that, A, either he was turning chicken, he was afraid to confront this, these protesters. They did not know what he was doing. But soon he came out in public. He made very fighting speeches in parliament. He said that these people were terrorists who should not be allowed to continue like this. And he invoked for the first time very rare emergency powers never used before in Canada. Now, interestingly, those who accuse Trudeau of not allowing Canada to become great, realize its full potential by becoming a weak need liberal, forced his hands into making him more authoritarian, more dictatorial than he probably would have dared to on his own. So when this happened, uh, there were two things. Uh, he gave orders to police to clear uh, the truckers. So uh, tear gas was used. Now tear gas is used very often in our country. So we don't know what the impact is where it is not used ever. So tear gas was used, stun guns were used, water cannons were kept on ready and uh, mounted uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Police was marching out. When this use of force was there and the police uh, warned the truckers that they would be arrested as for their anti-social activities, they would be treated as criminals, they would be jailed. Uh, in the beginning, there was a lot of bluff and bluster. Um, the truckers said that they would not yield ground because they had a right to peaceful protest, they had a right to freedom of expression. They were opposing Trudeau as an individual, as a person who ideologically had nothing uh, they shared with and who was uh, taking Canada down the drain. Now, all this was happening, but their actions were causing loss of livelihood, loss of public peace, disturbance in public peace, and people were getting irritated. While all this was happening in Canada, similar movements were picking up. Uh, there was a freedom convoy, uh, sympathetic, not sympathetic, but in France itself, which raised almost the same issues. There was there were similar convoys in, in uh, Belgium, in Netherlands. Now, if you look at it, this seems to be a replay of the movements which start in the American continent, like the Black Lives Matter or the ultra-right, uh, far-right movements, racist movements, people who refuse to uh, give up their rights, they don't talk of the duties. So the governments should be severely limited, federal uh, structure should be strictly uh, treated sacrosanct and respected, and the rest should be allowed to do as they wish. Now, Canadians have been very tolerant, they have been a very pluralistic society, but this is putting a stress on their life, which is going to maybe transform Canada, not necessarily for the good, because if the Canadians have to, the government has to repeatedly evoke stringent measures to break these protests, there would be a reaction against them. And of course, because Trudeau does not enjoy that kind of a majority, the country might soon divide it, like United States of America to the south, almost equally between those who support far-right ideologies and those who are more tolerant, more liberal, more democratic. But can a liberal democratic government without adopting authoritarian means, strict breaking down of these far-right challenges, remain in power is a very interesting issue. So how this is going to transform, not only in Canada, the same question may be asked about how do you suppress, suppress neo-Nazis, how do you suppress far-right people, and this is an election here in France. And the new government, new coalition government in Germany is not like the stable uh, government which Angela Merkel had uh, sort of performed for years. So you have this interesting thing. For the time, the truckers have been largely removed, although pockets of resistance continue. Traffic on Ambassador Bridge has been restored, although the movement of goods and services is uh, curtailed. But then the problems remain. Uh, even if the protests are all cleared out, the scar tissue left will be very, very disturbing from, for Trudeau. What is most important for us to consider at this moment is that what is going to happen in coming days to this clash of ideologies, of liberal democratic uh, beliefs, value systems, and those who do not believe in these but support authoritarian regimes for whatever reason, for reasons for racial superiority, for reasons of religious intolerance, for reasons of a very dogmatic insistence on uh, rights being more important than duties, that a citizen should bear arms, citizen should follow his conscience, not even disregard public good and not worry about even in the days of pandemic whether vaccination should take place or not. It is only a symptom of a larger malaise and this malaise is 
being encountered all over the world today. It is not only USA, it is France where President Macron is going to be facing a re-election. He has to present an image of a strong leader, whether it is Brexit and fisheries rights dispute, whether it is Islamophobia which is uh, gaining ground in Europe all over the place. It is withdrawing from Africa in the Sahel region where it was maintaining peace, whether it is extending its support to Earth's well colonies like in Lebanon and so on, is making a presence in the Southwest Pacific. This problem remains with almost all leaders, all big leaders, India included, where a strong leader has more charismatic appeal to the people than a genuinely democratic and a tolerant leader. But the fundamental question remains, can, is the same, can the open society protect itself against its enemies by remaining an open society or it has to become a little authoritarian at least to contend with these challenges? What happens only the coming days will show us. In the neighborhood, interesting and again disturbing developments have been taking place in Pakistan. To begin with, there was news that the Taliban had attacked the Pakistani border forces deployed in the Jalalabad border and there were casualties. This was the first time when the Taliban had failed to control attack on their uh, friends, so, so to speak, the Pakistanis across the border. People had thought that when Taliban took pow power in Kabul, that Pakistan had made a, a gained a strategic victory. At least the Haqqani faction, which was part of this integral part of the Taliban government, was considered to be a Pakistani uh, creation, and they thought that now Pakistan would dictate developments there. But it did not happen. First of all, the argument is that the Taliban are having a problem with the Islamic uh, Sultanate Emirate of uh, the Khorasan province. And this includes parts of Pakistan as the geography of the Sultanate of the Emirate of the Islamic uh, uh, Caliphate. Now, there again, the problem is that is this a... Uh, is this a cover behind which the Taliban want to say that, look, we are not being able to uh, introduce reforms which we promised because our hands are tied because of the Islamic extremist groups? Or is it they are playing hands and gloves with them? But the net result was that the Pakistan for the first time bled on this border. Pakistan's problems were not confined only onto, uh, onto this border. There were insurgent attacks the rebel attacks, terrorist attacks in Balochistan with very great frequency. In one, 10 people died, in another, 5 people died, which again displayed to the world that the Pakistani government was not in a position to control this challenge in Balochistan. Now, this Balochistan is strategically very significant because A, it touches the Iranian border, B, the China-Pakistan economic corridor passes through this area. And in past also, some Chinese lives of advisors, experts have been, labor has been lost in incidents like this. So it seems that the Pakistan, which seemed to have become a little comparatively stable for the past few days, once again, people had thought that after Afghanistan, things might destabilize. It, the word, their worst fears are coming true. The Pakistani Prime Minister, undertook an ambitious visit to China during the Winter Olympics. Now, the whole purpose of this was to show solidarity with the Chinese. Very few heads of states or heads of government had gone to China to take part in this Winter Olympic. Uh, only the Russians had been present there. The North Koreans had been there. But everybody else had boycotted it diplomatically. Even those countries which had sent their sporting contingents had not been there. So it was expected that once there is this show of loyalty and friendship, the iron friendship, as the Chinese and Pakistanis say. Uh, Imran Khan would come back with assurances of financial aid, bailing out lines of credit, some technical support. Nothing of this kind happened. Although it is customary in diplomatic circles that not even the most unsuccessful visit, state visit, is accepted as an unsuccessful state visit. But this time it was quite clear that he had returned empty-handed. That's one thing. Then other small irritants people have been noticing in Pakistan. They say that Imran Khan's days are numbered. The army has withdrawn its support from him. They are already playing, uh, propping up uh, either Nawaz Sharif or somebody else. And the game of musical chairs might begin again. One other sign of this was this, that Bill Gates had made his first trip to Pakistan and uh, Imran Khan had given, hosted a luncheon for him to which all the top generals were 
invited. But when uh, Imran Khan posted a picture of this luncheon in his uh, so official social media handle, it was very crudely photoshopped. So people were speculating whose face had been uh, airbrushed. And then it was, of course, easy to guess. The ISIS general did not want his face to be shown there. And of course, it is a cloak and dagger's business. But Imran Khan seemed to have made a faux pas here as well. Now, why is Imran Khan losing his touch? Imran Khan has been articulate. Imran Khan has a charismatic personality. Imran Khan has escaped charges of, avoided charges of personal corruption. Absolutely. But the problem is that a no confidence motion against him has also been put in the Pakistani parliament. Now, there is a law in Pakistan that if a person doesn't vote according to the whip, he can be expelled by the head of the party. Imran Khan is apparently confident as of this moment that he can weather this storm. But the point is that his, his party is not in simple majority on its own. It is a coalition government. And it is not very clear whether the same law applies to his allies and whether he can expel them or not. So situation in Pakistan seems to be in a bit of a flux. Now, this is not a matter of satisfaction for India, that whenever there is instability in Pakistan, the chances are that the government in Pakistan would look for an alibi, look for an enemy without, and India certainly will have to start from square one again to build bridges, talk to people, establish a dialogue, open um, channels of communication. Although one does believe that the government of India has back channels with the army, with the members of civil society there, etc. But the civil society is not as influential in Pakistan as it is in a democratic country like India. And the alignments of Pakistan with China and with the United States would continue. Nothing is going to change them. So I think people in India, however well-meaning towards Pakistan, have to realize that we have to prepare for a long period of conduct of enmity with Pakistan without an outbreak of disastrous hostilities. Another interesting news item in recent days was the Indian External Affairs Minister's physical visit to Australia to take part in the Quad's um, summit. Now the Quad summit is a very interesting situation because when Quad's was formed, India was very enthusiastic about it because it was given to understand that India would play a major role in the strategic countervailing of China, not only in South China Sea, but India was tempted to extend its horizons all the way up to the Pacific region. So we one heard a lot about Indo-Pacific. There also was um, ex there ex also were expectations that India would benefit uh, from an Indo-Australian bilateral interaction reinforced by Quads because Australia was experiencing stresses and strains in its relationship with uh, with China. But before these hopes could even uh, blossom. Uh, the Americans immediately came out with another scheme called AUKUS, which was a tripartite arrangement of Anglophone people of United Kingdom, USA and Australia uh, as a primary vehicle of strategic pursuit of strategic interest in this region. And Quads was marginalized. And it was made clear, applying a balm on India's hurt sentiments, that look, it would play an important role in vaccine diplomacy, in anti-terrorist fight, in cultural and technological interactions, exchanges, etc., etc. But it was not the same thing. Now, it was not only India which was disappointed. I think the formation of AUKUS was a great blow to the Atlantic Alliance, uh, to the United States relationship with its European partners. The French were particularly irritated because the Australians cancelled the deal of, with nuclear submarines with the France and decided to buy the nuclear submarines from UK. A lot of arguments were there. The French were more expensive. They were taking a lot of time. The UK nuclear submarines were more sophisticated, were delivered in time, were going to be delivered in time, etc., etc. So the French Prime Minister said categorically that this was a stab in the back, they had been betrayed, they had been kept out of the loop, and the American President had to ultimately apologize. But apologies were too little, too late, and this problem remains. Now, how does it affect India? Now, if Australia is equipped with British-built nuclear submarines, their presence would be the primary instrument of countervailing or monitoring the Chinese naval presence, submarine or otherwise, in South China Sea, in Indian Ocean, in the Pacific. Now, what does it mean for the India? 
so far Indians thought that the Indian naval presence from Andaman uh, Nicobar Islands beyond would be the most important naval presence to countervail China. But if Australian submarines are there, then it is a different ball game together. India's relative significance in the strategy would cut down. So this was one part which the Indian foreign minister hopefully is addressing with in the Quad's meeting behind the scenes on the sidelines with the counterparts. The second hope again is interesting. If you talk in terms of bilateral uh, trade, then you don't need a quads. The bilateral trade would follow the logic of economics that if the Australians realized that they could not um, export what they did to China and Indians stepped in, it has happened. Uh, the Adani group's involvement in the coal mines, which were not without controversy. But this is a short-term gain which India can hope for because majority of the exports of Australia, whether it is beef or pork or livestock or wines, cannot be directed towards India. And also the distance um, uh, militates against uh, uh, forging very close ties between these two countries. Uh, when India talks of look east, act east, there is the whole of Southeast Asia, which is a bridge sort of or a barrier, therefore, between India and Australia. Now, the ASEAN countries, the 10 ASEAN countries are dependent for their foreign trade on China. So can the Quads play any role in fostering, forging, reinforcing India's relationship with ASEAN and Southeast Asia? They are not without stresses and strains with Australia either. Now, this is something which we have to very carefully think through. Now, the Indian students are very important for the education industry. They are second only to the Chinese in Australia. The Indian tourists are important for the Australian economy. But at the same time, the fact remains that the quads was not primarily between bilateral relationship between India and Australia. So, when we are talking of quads, we are thinking of a plan which was originally it was not strategic. It came in the wake proposed by Je the then Japanese Prime Minister uh, Shinjo Abe in the wake of the tsunami. But over a period of time, it had emerged as maybe a quasi-strategic uh, gathering which could countervail Chinese influence in the region. Chinese, of course, have looked at it as a military alliance system. They had said that it would be like a foam on sea. It will dissipate very soon. The challenge for India is when it, when our foreign minister comes back from Australia, how do we make this work? How do we make the quads work when the Americans seem to be putting their trust more on the AUKUS? This is something which Indians will have to live with. That is all we have for you this week. And let's quickly review what we have seen. We have seen an international crisis which doesn't seem to end a uh, confrontation between two superpowers, so to speak, which is likely to have a fallout, whether there is a flashpoint, there is an explosion or not. It is going to impact on the national interest of almost all the countries in the world, majority of European Union, uh, the countries like India, which have good ties with both America and Russia. And also the problem is, it basically is a clash uh, of the Cold War variety between an ideological confrontation, a military confrontation, a battle of nerves, and then, uh, which is, despite the existence of a hotline, despite direct communications at the summit level between the American president and the Russian president, no progress has been made. So do we raise a question that new mechanisms in this digital age, virtual meetings are not enough. There has to be some mechanism which gives diplomacy a chance to succeed. It also is not a game of blind man's bluff. It is not a battle of nerves, who blinks first, which we must worry about. The role for Indian diplomacy is limited in a confrontation like this. But what this, what this confrontation has brought to light is the fractured worldview in Europe, contending national interest of the major European countries and United States, and the Russians and the Chinese at the moment apparently having a better suit of cards in their hands to play and a greater determination to force a confrontation on their adversaries. So that's one part which we'll have to think how it unfolds. The second interesting thing was the battle between truckers and Prime Minister Trudeau in Canada. It was not just ultra-right truckers 
and one so-called liberal or pseudo-liberal prime minister in Canada that is a reflection of a worldwide conflict which is taking place between forces of democracy, individual rights, human rights, pluralism and authoritarian regimes which are ultimately attractive to people who believe in racial superiority, who believe my right uh, over any duties which the state might prescribe to me. And this is an infectious trend which we see seems to have spilled over from United States to Canada, from Canada to France, to Belgium, to Netherlands. We have signs of this in Germany, the rise of neo-Nazi movement, racism even in Scandinavian countries. There was a summit of democracy some time back. But we have to probably think in terms of redefining democracy, not necessarily the Western concept which is imposed by Americans by regime change, but countries having the right to determine what form of government they have and how does a genuinely democratic, pluralistic society and regime face the challenge of uh, ultra-right dictatorial forces. Then we come to neighborhood. A neighborhood is always the primary area of interest for India. There the portents don't seem to be very good again. Uh, again it appears that Ibrahim Khan is facing some challenges to his authority. There are likelihood of a period of short period of instability in Pakistan and there might be even situations of conflict between Afghanistan, the Taliban and their erstwhile patrons, Pakistan. So we have, and Balu, the, the Balu challenge continues. So we have to worry about that. There have been some stresses apparent between Pakistan's relationship with its Islamic brethren in like Saudi Arabia or uh, time-tested allies like China, but they are unlikely to give up Pakistan entirely and United States, China and the Muslim countries would probably bail Pakistan out in short term, but Pakistan will remain a basket case in long term and India will have to live with it. And this brings us to the conclusion, in the end, the Indian participation in quads might from time to time make the headlines, but we don't think so at least, uh, that in long term it can be a pr highest priority for us or it can be a core organization through which Indian national interest can be served. Till we meet again next week, thank you and goodbye.